Hey guys, good afternoon. Thank you so much for making yourself available and join us for this important uh, conversation. My name is Xiao An. Uh, I'm a senior program officer and I lead education work at the Fed's Institute for the past 11 years. Um, I, and we have been very proud as a sponsor and a supporter of CASEL and SEO field. And I, I'm in awe thinking about uh, 1994, a good 28 years ago when CASEL as an organization had the name and the birth out of uh, many meetings at the Fetzer Institute and it has been a good 28 years. Right now, as a private foundation conveniently located in Southwest Michigan, and we have one of the most powerful mission statement in the world. Please take a look at the, the screen right in front of you. I would love just to read them for you. Uh, helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. I'm going to just pause for you just to sink in because I know this problem is getting you in ways that I can't imagine. A spiritual foundation for a loving world. At the Fetzer Institute, we believe in the possibility of a loving world, a world where we understand we are all part of one human family and we know our lives have purpose. In the world we seek, everyone is committed to courageous compassion and a bold love, powerful forces for good in the face of fear, anger, division, and the despair. I, if I were you, you probably, you know, something is going on. This is one of the most bold statements in the world, I think, that we have love at the very center. And it's because we believe children we are talking about here in this particular conversation, children thrive where love is present. And they tend to struggle when love is absent. Let's keep this as a larger context before and it beneath this most important conversation. And um, I, I do want in this case uh, to invite you into uh, a little more uh, reflection piece, right? Just like many other foundations in the world, we care deeply about children, the growth, the development, and the well being. And then in this case, we also struggled by all what we're experiencing, what, what, by all what we're observing. When we heard numbers such as 55% of teachers in the United States have decided to leave the profession or to retire early, started a project measuring what matters for child well-being and a policy. They started in the 2021. Simultaneously, Graduate School of Education at Harvard University worked with Grandmakers for Education had a significant convening in early 2021 titled What's the Shared Vision for Education in the New Decade? Then this particular project we're going to talk about today, UNICEF, the project What Makes Me Core Capacity for Living and Learning, feels like the world is coming together to asking what are the skills that are so foundational and essential for make us human? Curiosity, driven for purpose. Today you will be introduced to a very short list of nine core capacity. And some names will be new to you guys, automatically and very much anticipated. I know some of you will ask questions about what they are and why they are only nine instead of five, like Castle's five pillars, right? And how do we know if these are core or essential? Let's jump right into it. However, I, I think, interesting enough, the list begins with listening, a skill that most of us born know how and what to do. And is that really the case though? Before we go into the content of peace, I believe it's important to have an experiential component that by offering an opening meditation, particularly on listening part. So if you like to work with me, I'm inviting you. It's four o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern time. You can probably use a little pause. I'm going to offer a, a experience for us to ponder a little more deeply about what listening means or can mean to us, why it is so important for children. And we want to experience that before we share that with children. Do you mind if I invite you to sit most comfortably, relaxed, 
breathe very naturally. Close or without close your eyes. Just be yourself. What does it feel like when we listen with our head? We tend to listen cognitively for information and the facts, then we analyze them and then we discern if they resonate with us or not. What does it feel like when we listen with our body? We listen to the lateness, the vibration, expressions, feelings, and the emotions. What does it look like and it feels like if we listen with our heart? Which is the sacred art of listening? A listening presence? When we listen with our heart and the soul, we do that through the lens of kindness and self-compassion. As a Quaker author, Douglas Steele puts it, which I like a lot, to listen another's soul into a condition of disclosure and the discovery, maybe more, almost the greatest service that any human being ever performs for another. When we listen with our soul, we listen into the being, into the deeper, best self of, of others. Can I ask you a question? When was last time that you listened so deeply to others? And how did it feel? When was last time that you were being listened to so deeply? And how did it feel? Then when was last time you listened deeply to yourself, your inner self, and how did it feel? Just listen. It is this love of curiosity, the capacity that is essential for our being in the world that led FETS Institute to a collaboration with Learning for Wellbeing Foundation and the UNICEF. It's my absolutely honor to introduce you, Daniel Kraw, the founding chair and the chair of the Learning for Wellbeing Foundation, and it just, this is, has been Daniel's decades and a lifetime work because he took great passion in the more holistic approach of human being, education, and healthcare. It's my honor to be working with Daniel for a good five years now, uh, Daniel. And I'd like to uh, it, uh, I can ask you a question uh, by way of your introduction. What was the motivation that led you to do this research? and then actually to develop this unique approach that you've been doing this for such a long time. Daniel, please. <clears throat> well, uh, Xion, uh, I'm immensely grateful for the opportunity that you have offered us to speak uh, to a Cassell audience. I have been uh, in admiration of Cassell and their work for many years. I participated to a meeting in Chicago a number of years ago. And uh, I look forward to a potential collaboration. Cassell is a collaborative. Let's extend the collaboration to Europe in some way or another. The, the motivation that uh, have brought me personally to support uh, uh, this activity has been the desire to really find ways to support uh, at this time in Europe, the development uh, of uh, <clears throat> an integrated holistic human development approach into healthcare, education and social affairs. And uh, <clears throat> in order to do that, uh, uh, we have operated through what we call the learning for wellbeing community and uh, I just wanted to give you a short introduction to our approach without wanting to take too much time because I would like Dominic to have ample opportunity to provide us the input uh, of uh, 
our report. Please, the next one. <clears throat> In order to uh, work together with others, we needed really to find ways to develop uh, a, a, a common language. And uh, in order to do that, we looked at the ways in which uh, human beings have described their way of existing for millennia. And uh, so you have uh, a spiritual dimension within which you have uh, three uh, aspects, which we call the mental, emotional, physical aspects. They can also be called principles, like the initiating principle, the shaping principle, and the manifesting principle. And each of those aspects can be experienced and lived by any one of us. And we, in the center, we write about the unique potential. Next slides, please. The unique potential, we call it, is the centralizing impulse that provides meaning and purpose to an individual life. The, it is uh, sometimes called uh, the soul. And uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, it uh, influences in an extraordinary way our behavior, we know our behavior are influenced by the environment, identity, cultural, personality, and temperament, and also by what we call pattern of processing. And the pattern of processing are uh, ways in which uh, we, I'll give you an example. Uh, if I have a project and I want to, uh, and it's a new project that I haven't worked before, I may want to think about it intensely. Someone else may want to talk about it because that's their way of beginning of learning and someone else may want to start doing it. So paying attention to the pattern of processing that are very closely related to the unique potential is an essential component of our approach. Next slide. You, this leads us to what uh, uh, we use as the definition of well-being, which is, is, it's a process and it's realizing one's unique potentials through physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual development in relation to self, others, and the environment. And you will notice that uh, in terms uh, of uh, the self, uh, inner diversity is uh, the, uh, which I relate to as the pattern of processing is an essential component uh, of the framework. And we place uh, the person clearly in the middle and Dominic uh, will uh, talk uh, more about it. Uh, we call the previous, uh, we call this our ecological framework and the one that I showed before with the three, uh, with the mental, emotional, physical circle, we call it the ontological model. Uh, please to the next one. So core capacities are actions that uh, develop throughout life and allow us to connect to ourselves, others and the environment. I call them window into yourself and into others. They have been identified through practice for many, many years of our work. We look at them as innate. We all have them. So they are strengths we can used to support our understanding of life. They can be experienced in the three aspects. You just had uh, uh, Sean take us through the experience of uh, listening from the mind, from the heart, and from the body. We look at them as cornerstones of life skills. 
And now, uh, with this uh, uh, study that have been carried out by the Innocenti Center of Research of UNICEF, uh, led uh, by Dominic, we have a beginning of evidence to support the importance of those capacity for human development. I would like to introduce Dominic now, uh, that I met first uh, at the Child Wellbeing Indicator meeting in 2012, where actually we presented our approach and he at that time already told us that it would be important to tr find evidence to support it. And uh, right, we started this work with Dominic when he was chief uh, of educational research at the Innocenti Center. And right now, Dominic is chief of social economic analysis uh, at the research center of Innocenti. So I'll pass on to Dominic uh, the battle. Great, th thank you, Daniel. Uh, it's really great to be here and be able to talk to, to Castle. As Daniel said, with great deep respect for the work of Castle. Um, the work that I'm going to present to you now um, is a synthesis of studies that lots of other people have done. And so we're very much standing on the, the shoulders of giants as we've built an evidence base uh, in support of core capacities. Now, I know we're not pushing on a locked door when we talk about capacities or competencies or social emotional skills. Um, but I, when we talk to Castle, I, I think that though we need to sort of distinguish a little bit the differences of the core capacities model with other models we've seen. And I'll start by giving you a little personal background. Um, so I used to work at OECD where I was the focal point on child well-being and that's when I met Daniel. And I was working on child well-being measurement, global child well-being measurement. I started with UNICEF's work um, and the European Commission, and then eventually went to OECD to, to do the work there. And wherever I looked for statistics and information on what, what was child well-being in different countries, I found an awful lot on education related to literacy, reading and numeracy and science. And uh, I found some things on health behaviors but there wasn't a great deal of, of good information about social emotional skills. There wasn't a great deal of information about you know, children's risks um, or family functioning. Some of the things that are a bit more day to day, we were concerned whether children behaved well and learned well, and that missed out a big part of life. So I started to write about gaps in evidence and I wrote to Pisa and Pearls and Tims and others to make some noise about it. And then I, when I joined UNICEF, I was working on child well-being and education again, I was chief of education research. <coughs> and I got myself involved in UNICEF's efforts um, to, to, to work with life skills and measure life skills, including the life skills and citizen, citizenship education work in the Middle East and North Africa. And I worked, um, worked a bit with UNESCO over the time. And we talked an awful lot about what would be a good framework for life skills and citizenship education. Building on the laws, for instance, um, or others. Um, but uh, I was always intrigued by more elementary and innate measures of children's skills and capacities. And having spoken to, to Daniel and Linda O'Toole and others in the team of the Learning for Wellbeing Foundation over the years, I am. Um, I was, was sort of taken with the idea that we should do some research on more elementary skills, more elementary capacities than those that are combined into um, composites, important though they may, may be, but composites of skills like negotiation or communication skills. So what are the core capacities? This model, as I said, was attractive because it, it looked at elementary skills. It's about the human ability to relate to oneself, others, and the environment. We'll talk a bit about that. But here's the point, the elementary. It's about building blocks of life skills and bigger skills. Uh, they're often overlooked, the, ex the expectation that children will listen well or sit still. Uh, it, no matter how many times the teacher tells the kid to sit still or, or listen, um, it's 
it's a lot rarer to hear well uh, the teacher explaining how to do either of those things and more um the the the, the skills are not designed as i say to to do with commod commodification or institutional qualification it doesn't promote social economic uh, or civic over each other and we've shown or at least it was theorized and we've shown i think with our evidence that they evolve and they can be taught out of children which is an issue because an education system is the biggest part of welfare for children wherever we are in the world in the us it's about it's got to be about 60, 65 percent of their cents in every dollar spent on a child between zero and 18. Um, so uh, we, we also believe as elementary parts of, of life skills and other life outcomes, including interpersonal relationships, family function, inter intergenerational solidarity, these can drive both unique and full potential as it promotes agency. Can we move to the next slide, please? So here are the nine core capacities. I should say, some of you are wondering why UNICEF's involved in, in this type of work, particularly the guy that moved from education to, so, uh, to social policy. Well, originally, child well-being in OECD is in social policy, so I've always been in social policy, but UNICEF is involved because the um, development of core capacities or development of capacities is mentioned in, in the rights of the child, indeed in articles related to children's own expression of their, their own rights. When we talk about spirituality, which we will do in a, in a bit, spirituality is actually mentioned four times in the UNCRC, that's the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Life skills, however, it's not mentioned once, but that's not, a, not really a, a downside of things. I mean, income poverty is not mentioned as a particular outcome. So having dealt with that, these are the nine core capacities. On the top left, that's a little girl and she's discerning patterns. She's putting together a jigsaw that as we move in clockwise, you can see she's listening on a the old tin can and the string. Some of us used to do that or climbing a tree. That's where she's embodying. This is also something some of us used to do, observing through a telescope. She's watering the plant and this is meant to, to, to illustrate empathy. She's reflecting in her diary, reflecting on a day and making notes. That's a reflection. There's sensing with the, the butterfly relaxing just above that in the bottom left hand corner. Um, that's uh, inquiry. Um, she's, she's learning how to study things. Let's move to the next slide. And as Daniel showed, we base these, these core capacities. Uh, well, we'd like to think about these core capacities as what makes up an individual. Um, they're seen from different perspectives. What makes the, you know, that we're all, and we're all, first Sean said that it might be five, it might be nine. Uh, since we've published this, the most convincing argument I've heard is about including expression. Um, but whatever the share of these different skills and however we see them and apply them through different perspectives, that makes up our unique potential. And that makes us all a bit complex. And at least in my studies of child well-being, which all implemented the Bromf and Brenner model, which you can see in the complex systems model here, uh, which should be credited to Linda O'Toole and, and Jean Gordon, the children are in a complex setting uh, with self, others, and the environment, how they influence and express, and then back and forth through that. But what we were missing in our standard measure, standard reviews of well-being was the complex system that is the child, or the complex system, which is every, each one of us that makes us unique. So um, we try and in our study to look at, you know, what drives the complexity within us through differences in core capacities and what they, they, they achieve in the, in the bigger system. Some of those old traditional goals like health and education outcomes and so on. And we understand that the child within a complex system can be influenced by various levels. Uh, and um, I, want, I want to say micro, meso, macro, but you understand different levels of, of influence from the very broad, the environment through to those close to them, the school, the family and um, peer groups. So let, let's move to the next slide, slide please. 
Um, and why should we all be interested in core capacities? It's something we, we, we're used to doing when we're writing studies, certainly those that we want to influence policy for. Actually, if you're going to say, why are, you writing it? Why, why are we writing about core capacities? Well, I, I, I complained about the lack of good information on, on children's outcomes that wasn't about things that they will become well-behaved and smart, but things that they are, their well-being today. Um, how do we change people's um, actions? How do we change the discourse about what, what, what systems should achieve for children? What we should prioritize in education systems? Well, we, require, we require still, uh, in mo much of the world, despite the good efforts of Casla and others, a paradigmatic shift from children, from school systems as being commodifying to school systems as being holistic development spaces. Um, and to, to sort of to, to show something matters, uh, at least in policy circles, we need to begin to measure it, and then we need to begin to analyze how it influences the goals of policy. So if, we, if we're good at measuring and proving the core capacities matter, and we should pay attention to the very elementary aspects of human development. We expect it to feed through to improve policies for children, improve school practices, improve adult interactions, and fundamentally improve life outcomes for children and, and for everybody, which I hope is everybody's ambition on this call. It's certainly mine. Can we go to the next slide, please? So what did we do to build this evidence base? We want to achieve all of these things. Well, we had, first of all, we started with a great meeting in, in FETSA. FETSA got together some very smart people and learning for well-being came along and I, I came along with a couple of colleagues from UNICEF and we talked out more about what the core capacities meant and more about the res what the research could do and we got a lot of great great input and out of that group we identified a technical group and a, a steering group who would help us at UNICEF with our research team write nine working papers on each of the core capacities and they're available online. Um, each one of them was a literature review or there was a structured literature review. I mean, this wasn't, it wasn't sort of Campbell collaboration style systematic review, but it was systematic um, in its process and it was replicated for each study, for each working paper. And essentially what we would look for um, was evidence in the literature using all of the normal search terms, the Boolean models, you know, sort of things to, to search a set of databases. They're all clearly mapped out in each study um, for the core capacity and synonyms of the core capacity and research that has looked at the provided metrics and changes in that core capacity, either what was driving that capacity or what that capacity might achieve. And we reviewed thousands of studies and came down to 260 in total. And we, we came down to such a few because we went through quite a rigorous uh, Q&A process. And the, the bubbles there show the steps that, that was with relaxing. We found 377 entries, or I think, sorry, reflecting, 377 entries. Um, uh, we, we read titles and abstract got down to 98. We excluded 64 on the basis of the steps and reviewed 34. And then with each of the nine papers, we wrote the synthesis study, which I hope you'll all uh, read uh, or at least flick through. Can we go to the next slide, please? The quality assurance steps were basically asking three questions about any empirical study. Uh, if you're using data in the study to represent some sort of concept, then it should be conceptually coherent. You all should operationalize that concept well. So the question was asked, if we're talking about relaxing, is the data used representing the outcome of interest? Um, uh, if, if you're talking about uh, the health, health behavior outcomes because you want to show relaxing um, influences health behavior outcomes, then they all also need to be well measured. Uh, they need to be methodologically valid, valid, which means the author needs to use the right models and methods to test those associations. And they need to be scientifically valid, which means that the tests need to be fully reported 
and fully and correctly interpreted. We also checked for ethical standards. Um, and uh, that, that led to quite a lot of rejections, uh, actually, as you could see in the last um, slide. And each, for each study, this is a systematic bit, we registered the method, the intervention, and the, 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 how the, the intervention was delivered, uh, where it was undertaken, the ages of the children, uh, the results, um, and links to other core capacities. Because uh, we're particularly interested if we're going to influence policy, um, not to say, dear policymaker, here's nine things that are completely exclusive and you ought to be achieving them all at once. We want to say, um, dear policymaker, here are nine things that matter. And here's an indication of which one you should do first. Uh, we all acknowledge um, that public services are not, uh, you know, absolutely full of money or full of time. So uh, we had to come up with a, uh, an approach there. Can I go to the next slide? I'm gonna move a bit quicker so we can get some questions in. So the key findings of the studies, we looked at them, we found that some studies, when we found linkages between the studies, that some seem to be gateway capacities in the sense that, that there were the types of capacities that children had to develop in order to develop others. And there's the types of things that let information in, listening, embodying, observing, and sensing. The, Core capacities were not all, you know, inherently positive, nor, nor negative, obviously. And that there was evidence that over-reflection could turn to rumination, and that, 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 that the use of intuition, uh, sorry, sensing, um, which is used in which children, you know, sort of say, oh, I think I know the answer to this, and away they go, um, could, could lead to children sort of um, moving, slipping into guesswork. Um, we know that when in dyads, social diets, it says adults and children, but social diets, that for these to really work, that the two different skills may be applied at once from the different parts of that dyad. Uh, uh, you know, if children are inquiring, they're going to get more out of it if, if the adult is a better listener. Um, it's, it's that straightforward. That enabled, there was lots of evidence on environments and how they either enabled or, or, or affected children evidence on the color of desks or the noise from the street um, or, or just the, the, the conditions in the, in the home reduced, re, could, could promote or reduce a children's development of the capacity. And actually in some cases it was, they were using, they were crowding out one thing for another. So listening um, was being affected by children uh, being overstimulated and observing too many things going on around them. Um, and there's all, also all of the socioeconomic, sociodemographic um, intersectionality, which we found, and you can see there. So as we move to, we'll go through the, the findings for a few. So if we just click through to the bubbles. So this is how discerning patterns is, is uh, identified. I, I think this is a bit of a, um, a very powerful skill when, when, when put together. Um, or capacity to perceive what's in, interconnected and recognize independency and relationship of parts to the whole. It also on its flip side means that you can identify things which you ought not to be paying attention to. I hope this isn't applying to the seminar right now. Um, our study in looking at the different age groups and the studies we looked at in our paper showed that we found evidence of an onset of this, of application of this onset about four or five years old. And it was linked to strategic thinking and self-regulation, which were increasing by age in the studies that we looked at. It doesn't mean they're the only things, and it doesn't mean that's the age. It definitely begins, but that's the earliest age we could find, and these were in the evidence base. Um, we found that, that, it was in the, that, that discerning patterns was associated with higher learnings outcome in primary school, working memory, executive function. And... Uh, um, social outcomes as well, including physical, mental, social, emotional health, social functioning and improved learning practices, self-regulations in there. Uh, inquiring the capacity to seek what can expand knowledge, actions, tracking, asking and uncovering experience with openness and curiosity. We found that onset very early, linked to other outcomes, um, linked to spiritual development, and those little bubbles show where there was a direct part, the, the direct evidence from the literature that it, it, it significantly associated with another core capacity or a synonym 
of that core capacity, where all of it's available in the study. Can we go to the next one? Um, okay, listening is here. This is the one, the one we found evidence of the earliest onset of in utero. Um, different types of listening, um, active listening, spatial listening, linked to learning outcomes, self-esteem. Um, and, uh, and why you can see it's associated with all of the other nine core capacities, maybe related to early onset, maybe related to its gateway, and more work to be done. I'd be interested to hear what people think next. Okay, reflecting. Um, you can see again, there's evidence of, of a very early onset, in pre preschool onset, and an increasing of reflection over age. This is one of the ones that had uh, negative outcomes when children were ruminating, and it's linked to just a few but important core capacities. Can we go to the next one? And um, what we found, I'm just going to summarize some key steps. If we click to the next thing. What we found as we go across the age-related development, that listening, empathizing, and inquiring were all found before the age of, of two, evidence of, of children applying these things and these skills being variable and malleable in that age, the age range. As children were still in the preschool period, as we click on, all of the other six came into play. If we click again, as we move into adolescence or later middle child and adolescence, there's fluency in, a, in various um, various core capacities, including a slump in, 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 in sensing, a slump in empathy, effective empathy, uh, self-regulation, adolescence. And can we click again? And there's, they're, they're, it's not just they're all developing at same speeds, they also um, uh, develop at, at different speeds as we map out the, the literature. Can we move to the next slide? So we came up with several sets of recommendations. I won't elaborate these because we need to be talking instead of listening now, but there's good evidence that parental practices matter in the children, of the, the development of these innate capacities in children, which we link very strongly to the child social, emotional, physical and health development. Um, one of the key things is, is parents being active in inquiry and reflection with children, creating the space for questions in story time and we find, which is a co common pattern in all of these things, that well-resourced home environments uh, make a difference. Can we move next? For practitioners, um, we're not just talking about education practitioners, but anybody who's paid a public dollar to involve themselves in the development of children should be aware of age-related development. A lot of it even before the child meets a, a formal care setting, a formal education setting. The children are already inquiring non-verbally and empathizing non-verbally uh, prior, prior to ages two and three. Um, and all services should be involved in the protection and promotion of these skills. And we have a lot of work to do in many countries which, which underinvest a great deal in, in, in the, the necessary social health and childcare services that precede um, ages four and five. The US has low investment overall in comparison to average high-income countries. Can we move to the, the next slide, please? Policymakers need to support these practitioners. They can't do it all on their own. That means providing additional resources and there's space in many budgets for it. If we just look at spending around COVID and indeed sort of restrictions on school practices, curricula, et cetera, needs to be, it needs to be adapted. But I'm sure you're well, you're well versed in these types of recommendations. So we move over to the, the next slide, please. Yeah. So we make the ages, we make so we make the case in the in the study, even though the study is just our first phase of work, the core capacity is essential prerequisites to child development. And to some of the goals we all want to achieve, whether it be more complex life skills, learning outcomes, health behaviors, um, or other. Um, and the other points I've made. So we'll move on to the next slide. Ah, that's good. That's my last slide. We do have a phase two of the study plan and we could perhaps talk about that in plenary. Over from me, thank you. Well, thank you, Dominic, for taking us through that and uh, Daniel for um, your introductory remarks as well um, that, that led into the survey. So we do have time for some questions. So I am going to go ahead and dive 
um, into those. Um, but first, I did want to remind everybody that you can access the report um, at the URL on the screen, and we're also putting it into chat. Um, and we also have, um, our, or UNICEF and the other partners of the uh, report have this wonderful interactive website that I encourage you to explore that really dives into the capacities and um, their their implications. So um, check, check that out. And um, again, we're putting that link in the chat. All right, let's take a look at some of the questions that have come in. Um, so, and, and Dominic, you, you were alluding to this, so this is a, a great first question to start with, but um, what is the future of the core capacities research um, and what are you hoping to explore in the future? So what we're trying to do in, well, we understand that the evidence we've put together is really just, just proof of principle. There are measures of these innate skills, these innate skills, and capacities linked to things that governments are trying to promote for children. Um, and so we think it's worth pursuing these in more detail and depth to sharpen up some of the findings so we can sharpen up some of the recommendations. Um, and so what we're intending on doing is building a pilot survey with some psychometrics and standard metrics to look at these core capacities together and introduce other potential capacities as we learn more from, from other people. Uh, we want to look as well at, um, and we want to do this in seven regions of the world because we're quite sure that there will be, or we expect, or we want to test for a uh, cultural biases and we want to look at different age groups. And this, the other thing we would like to do in building up our work around spirituality in this, we looked for evidence of the capacities being uh, applied from a spiritual perspective. We only found three studies and only really one that stood up to the empirical tests. Um, and that, that was disappointing. But the way we, we, we understand spirituality is how uh, it's, it's, it's how children or individuals are connected to the built and natural world around them. It's to do with connectedness as opposed to religiosity. And we all know when we feel in place, um, and we know that we've promised spiritual well-being to children in the UNCRC, but we don't have good evidence on it. And it feels a bit sad to promise something to kids and not work on it. So we're going to do some work on spirituality, again, across seven regions, qualitative work to understand children's perspectives. And the last thing is, there's plenty of these 260 studies, plenty of practice in there, you know, plenty of things we could experiment with. And so instead of waiting three or four years, which will take for phase two to run through, we want to begin some work on classroom practices and observation, observation studies to see what, what works um, from, well, see what's replicable from what we found in, in, the, in the process. So that's three things in phase two, but good to hear anyone's uh, advice. Uh, Daniel or Sean, you wanna add anything to that or we can go on to another question? All right, um, Dominic, this actually is another one for you. Um, this came in uh, while you were going through the capacities, um, but could you yeah. expand a little bit on spatial listening? Yeah, so it's about um, localizing noise in space. So where noise is coming from um, and also tones in speech. So it, it's, um, it's not, the active listening, and I suppose, it's not, I suppose we could have done some work on understanding to what extent this represented emotional perspective. But the way it's been described in the studies we looked at were primarily to do with children being able to recognize where a sound was originating from and, um, and to what degree uh, the tone in, a, in, a, in speech was affecting the, uh, the, the messaging. Very interesting. Um, and again, you can dig into that microsite for um, more, more information about that. Um, so let's see. Um, so how is what was found different or the same to what we already know about children's developmental stages? Can I jump in? I suppose it's me, unless Sean or Daniel, you want to? <laughs> well, I mean, um, I, I think I think it I think it's 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 a, a fund, fundamental shift in what we understand about children's development stages, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, I think 
first of all, it's a, it's a new perspective on what we understand as priorities for development. The high income countries right now are building foundational skills and doing preschool preparation and learning and literacy and numbers and letters uh, in the preschool period. Uh, the consent that, that don't think there's any real consensus. I mean, you go to you go play-based and nature-based learning in the Nordics and in the preschool period, and or you can go to the UK where they'll want you to be able to spell fruit before you enter school, or it's, it's going to be measured. What we're saying is that really neither of these things um, are, are the real goal. The real goal is to support the development of the child's toolkit for being themselves in the spaces that they're in and with the people around them and the and, and the generally utilizing that in then whatever whatever your 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 goal is that 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 follows so um i think the evidence so let me let me just just reflect just just challenge myself slightly <laughs> I'm not saying that the evidence on what on children's develop, development at, at present um, is, is, is spurious. Um, I'm going back to the point that if we measure what matters, we're going to find different, different trajectories of development. And, and I would challenge uh, some of the present sort of outcomes and you know, sort of being outside of social emotional learning um, that are being promoted. So paradigmatic shift, which should fundamentally change the trajectories and the trends that we're pursuing. Um, though if we're still happy with, with ensuring that kids are, are semi-literate before they enter school and that schools, that the kids are ready for school and schools are not ready for kids, um, we can rely on much of the existing evidence. Um, I hope that makes sense. Thank you, Dominic. I, I want to kind of offer uh, two, my two cents here. Um, I, it's an important question, what's the value add? And how is this new study and the report uh, help us in, in our educational practices? I think the uniqueness comes from uh, three angles. The first one is this is one of the very first meta-analysis of what's available internationally. I, I think that the rigor uh, uh, that we have going through the, the quality assurance and all that uh, provide enough validity in terms of public research, uh, look at uh, children development, different age groups and in the area, which is my point number two, is the foundational skills that will help and grow into the complex skills such as CASO's framework, self-aware and a collective awareness. Awareness is in my understanding is a more complex skill to have. But then when you have deep listening, sensing and a subtle sensing, this innate capacity children born with to be nurtured before they become active academic learner, those skills are not necessarily being taught or studied about. My third point, which is even more and the most important point is, this framework is unique in many ways. The framework, Daniel did a very good job introducing. You, the starting point is you see there's a unique potential in children. That is about children uh, you know, born into big mystery and it provide opportunity for them to self-discover something that is deep within themselves in relation to others and the natural world. I think it's a more holistic approach understanding children you know, who they are and who they are becoming by awakening into some of the innate capacity. I, I'm excited about uh, this level of elementary skill set Dominic used. Uh, you know, before we talk about 21st industrialized life skills. And I, I think it's, um, I don't know if I answered that question, but for Federal Institute standpoint, that is really help us at an individual level asking the question of who we actually are. And then at a collective level, and how do we relate it to each other and why that is important? It's because of the interconnectedness within the framework that is trying to say there's a unique potential each and every one of us born with 
And also there's a larger purpose and a calling for all of us to be together. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was a that was a really helpful explanation for about this study and its and its uniqueness um, out there amongst all the other studies. Um, so it'll be great to see um, the next steps that that Dominic referenced um, in the future. Um, we've got time for a few more questions. Um, so um, some folks are interested in um, your thoughts, all of your thoughts on um, how this information informs adult uh, social and emotional learning um, and not just parents to kids or um, teachers to kids, but also adults modeling their own in their own relationships, uh, their well-being. Dominic, any thoughts from the from the study? Any insights on the adult component? Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I was hoping that Daniel would, would jump in <laughs> because uh, I mean my focus has been primarily on 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 children. Um, so maybe Daniel will jump in, but I would just say that we're looking at we're looking at the development of these skills in, in childhood, but uh, the, the, the theory is that we carry them throughout their lives, and many of them are malleable and can grow and fall. And, um, what, what, how well they're applied is related to the people you talk to and their, their unique capacities. And, um, so there's things to learn from, from everybody there, but unfortunately our study does not look specifically at adult to adult interaction, but plenty, um, of, of, of relatable evidence, I should say about, um, sort of environmental conditions that might stymie or promote good interaction between people of whatever age. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, Daniel? Daniel, please unmute. I said, unfortunately, I, while the question was asked, I was reading the question that I saw on the Q&A. <laughs> So if um, you could uh, repeat it, I would appreciate yes, it. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so this question was around, um, basically around adults, social and emotional learning and how adults um, can help model these core capacities um, in their own relationships, um, not just in their relationships to children, but um, in their own adult to adult relationships. I mean, uh, it, it's an essential, uh, uh, as, I mean, it is, so essential to have adult model a proper use of core capacities. I mean, if you want, if you want children to listen to you, you need to listen and model listening. If you want to ask questions with curiosity, you need to ask questions with curiosity and modeling that. Uh, of course, uh, uh, in many settings, when we have a, an authoritarian approach to teaching, uh, you say, listen, but you don't listen yourself. So children do what you do, not what you tell them to do. So the modeling that parents or teacher have of their own use of core capacities is essential. If uh, even relaxing, if a teacher comes in stressed uh, and, and operates in a certain way, he's certainly not modeling a relaxing way of being. So uh, it is, uh, and it is uh, where the biggest issue is, how do we actually support uh, teacher and parents to model those core capacities so as to protect and support the core capacity of children and how we're going to do that, that's part of uh, our desire to collaborate uh, with uh, Cassell in as many ways as possible to find different ways in which that could be done and, uh, and supported. So uh, we are eager to see how Cassell clearly in their ways are actually supporting and protecting core capacity of adult and children in their own, in their own unique ways. And, and, the, and the fundamental uh, of, of the whole approach when we refer to unique potential is realizing truly and fully that everyone is unique. You cannot standardize 
your approach. You need to relate uniquely to every single child you are interacting with. And that requires using your sensing, your intuition, your being relaxed, being able to connect and ask questions with curiosity. All of that is there. Well, that I think was an excellent way to, to end our time together. And thanks to all of you who joined us today. We really appreciate um, your interest in this topic and all that you do to promote these core capacities and SEL, uh, social emotional learning uh, with the youth and the adults that you work with.